Hello, and welcome to the Worthy Life Project, where we interview great contemporary thinkers about what has shaped their choices and their understanding of the world. You can follow along with these conversations on Twitter, YouTube, and Substack, and you can always propose questions for us to ask our upcoming guests. I'm your host, Leah Sargent, and I'm really delighted today to welcome O. Carter Sneed, who is a professor of law and the director of the D. Nicola Center for Ethics. Professor Carter Sneed is one of the world's leading experts on public bioethics. His research explores issues relating to neuroethics, enhancement, human embryo research, assisted reproduction, abortion, and end-of-life decision-making. He's the author of What It Means to Be Human, The Case for the Body in Public Bioethics, which I'll say straight up is one of my favorite books I've read this year, and I'd be getting it for a lot more people for Christmas if it weren't a slightly surprising book to unwrap under the tree. So thank you so much for joining us, Professor Sneed. Thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure to be with you. In your new book, it's a book about bioethics, but in some ways it seems a lot a book for lay people, just about how we relate to our bodies and how we understand our relationship to our bodies. And you really at the beginning of the book talk about the danger of forgetting the body and forgetting our nature as embodied beings. Can you expand a little on what you mean by that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you're right. The book is designed and was written with a general audience in mind. And honestly, the arguments of the book, I think, even though they take bioethical examples as the points of departure to explore the thesis, are meant to be for anybody who is interested in the question of what it means to be a human being and what it means to flourish as a human being. Uh, and forgetting the body is a kind of temptation that we have, uh, especially in our modern culture, in which we tend to associate ourselves really just with our minds. We associate ourselves with our mind and our will and our desire, and that's who we think the real us uh, is, or the real I am. And, uh, and in the book, I try to make the case for the proposition that that's actually not a full or accurate or complete or even humane account of our individual and shared lives together. We are uh, embodied beings. That's no, we're not just bodies. That's, that would be the opposite kind of mistake than the mistake of expressive individualism. We are, we are sort of the dynamic integrated uh, unity of body and mind. And, and that has, and our bodies, which allow us to experience the world and one another and nature and, and, uh, and we live as bodies and we die as bodies and we get sick as bodies. Um, the, uh, the idea is that, is that being embodied has certain kinds of inexorable entailments, both some of which are challenges, other of which are, I think, really gifts. And to forget that we are embodied means that we forget those inexorable aspects of our, of our existence, our vulnerability, our mutual dependence, our subjection to natural limits, but also the, the kind of the, the way in which we stand in relation to each other by virtue is embodied beings, because embodied beings need particular kinds of things to flourish. And that obligates us to one another in deep and interesting ways. How do we recollect this to ourselves on a day to day basis? Because I think growing up, I certainly had a very forgetful of the body uh, attitude. It's something I still try and move past now. Yeah. I think I thought about my body the way lighting design works in theater. If it's working well, you don't notice it. You only notice it when it's kind of jarringly out of place, uh, right. when you've sprained an ankle. But most of the rest of the time, you were talking about like, who is the eye here? I did think of the eye as the choices I made, the feelings I had, and my body was just the mechanism that carried that will around. Right. And I only cared about it if it malfunctioned. So yeah. on a day-to-day -day basis, when things are going well, how do we connect to that idea of being embodied? Yeah, being I, I think it requires cultivating our moral imagination. I think it requires us to remember certain things about our about the arc of our lives. It's easy to kind of have the, the sort of make the error of, of presentism or recentism or whatever the error is called, where basically your, your, your field of reference is so truncated to the now that you can't really get a full picture of reality. And if you think about the arc of our lives, we begin our lives completely dependent upon other people. We don't remember being babies. We can see pictures <laughs> and kind of reconstruct our memory, but you come into the world profoundly uh, dependent upon others. And it's because you are as an embodied being that you need certain things, you need warmth and you need nutrition and you need care, but also as dynamic integrated unities of mind and body, you need 
to develop virtues and habits. But again, that's another kind of dependence that we have on other people. So it's remembering our moments of dependence, remembering um, those times in which you know, even something silly, like, you know, you're in a bad mood because you haven't had, you know, enough to eat in a particular day, or you've, or you haven't had enough sleep, or you're, or, or you know, you drink a cup of coffee, and all of a sudden, you feel a sense of well being, these are all and, and if you don't disentangle that from your own consciousness, we're profoundly, uh, as I say, integrated our bodies and our minds and, 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 and our experiences shaped by both. Um, and so but if you remember our past, and you kind of intuit our future about our future dependence that again comes with being embodied creatures in time that are that are um fragile and needy and corruptible and subject to aging and disease and injuries and and that's that's part of what it means to be a human being and so i think again reflecting on reflecting on our own experience remembering our past thinking about our future and also seeing in others those others who are profoundly dependent maybe even disabled adults. You think about people who are not cognitively capable of constructing the sort of inner life that we have, that we associate with ourselves. But I think that we would agree that these are also human beings. They're also persons who have claims on us. And what, what does it mean that we live in a, in a moral community, in a, in a, in a, in a war, in a, in a, that the human family is composed of people whose commerce is sometimes just the passive acceptance of unconditional love and care, because their minds, probably because a defective body, are not capable of doing the things that we value and associate with ourselves when we're thinking too narrowly. That seems like a profoundly countercultural message because, you know, when you're naming these categories of people, what I'm hearing are categories of people who are often hidden from public life. You know, the elderly are often warehoused in nursing homes. Very young children are often, parents are discouraged from bringing them into public spaces because they're disruptive, because they don't have that degree of self-control. They just you know, express their dependence at a very high decibel <laughs> level, you know, regardless of what's going on around them. And disabled adults, to an extent, we see that parents' first instinct when a child has a natural curiosity about someone who's different from them is to say, you know, don't stare, right. as though it's embarrassing to be seen as disabled, that the politeness involves looking away. So I can see how an individual could try and start making an effort to not look away, to see more clearly these kinds of dependence. But how do we overcome this learned reaction that dependence is to a certain extent disgusting? Yeah, no, I think that's right. Um, I think I think we do have to, it's, it's deeply ingrained, especially among ho the high achieving people at your institution where uh, what's valorized is excellence and accomplishment and achievement and competition. And of course, I'm not suggesting those are bad things, but that's not the, I mean, unless we wanna take a very dark view of the world and our relationships to one another as a general matter, um, I think that we need to realize that that's one small part of, of, uh, of, of the way that gifts are distributed uh, in the human population. And, you know, one of the things that I talk about in the book, one of the important virtues for um, for embodied beings to flourish is the is the virtue of gratitude. Right. It's, it's part of the virtues of what McIntyre calls the virtues of acknowledged dependence, the virtues of uncalculated giving and graceful receiving. And once you realize that you, in fact, did not create yourself. Right. And, and I mean, no one I mean, you read Milton, you read you read the, the speech of Lucifer, the fallen angels. And they say, we don't we don't remember being created. We don't have any recollection of this. We don't regard ourselves as creatures. And because we don't regard ourselves, we, we're self created. We're self begotten. Um, and we can forget that. I mean, when, when we're super accomplished and we're really smart or athletic or talented or, you know, you're bestriding the world with your with your performance in different ways. You can really, really be lured into the illusion that you did this, that you created yourself. But all it takes is some some brief reflection, some honest reflection about how you got to where you are. And none of us would be here right now if it weren't at the very first moment of our lives, someone else decided to make us to make our good <laughs> their good without any hope of getting anything in return. And it's going to be that way again. You know, that's 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 the arc of a human life. And um, and so I, I think it's. You know, I, th I think that uh, we, we just have to, I mean, the question is, how do you teach these virtues? How do you do this? And I think you just have to cultivate, um, you know, uh, relationships with people in a way, and you have to cultivate the organs of civil society in a way that make it impossible for people 
to 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 indulge the fiction that they cre- that they're self created sources of original meaning. You know that that they that they are not connected to others in deep and important ways, and they they can make certain kind of claims on others that they didn't earn, like the way a baby has a claim on to care from her parents doesn't have to earn that right to be cared for by her parents. And for that matter, um, we have obligations that we don't choose uh, to take care of people, not just not just even people in our immediate family. You walk down the street and you see somebody lying on the sidewalk. There's a kind of, you have to think about, you know, this is a fellow human being and gifts have been distributed in a way that are pretty different for that person than they are for me. And I need to be open to the unbidden here. I need to be open to the possibility that, uh, that it's my job here to help take care of this person in some in some way, you know, and that's that's frightening and it's daunting and it dis, it disrupts all of your all, everything that you've rationally ordered in terms of your ambitions and your life. But uh, and nobody does it perfectly. And that's not to say you have to, you know, go join a monastic order or go join Mother Teresa's order in Calcutta. It just means that you have to kind of be, let's start with being nice to each other. Let's start with treating each other in a kind and compassionate and loving way. Yeah, I think it's so interesting you know, when you look at what happens when people draw our attention to that mutual dependence, that that fact that we aren't our own authors completely. I'm reminded a few years ago when you know now Senator Elizabeth Warren was running for Senate and you know was kind of talking about this idea of being mutually dependent and the question of where government comes into it and talked about someone who creates a business and says, you know, but you don't build that alone. You know, you drive your trucks on roads that we all pay for. And this was taken to an extent as an attack on the worth of a business person. When in fact, it's it's a fact about all of us, kind of regardless of what you think that implies about governance and tax policy, there's no one we can point to to say, yes, you did that. Everything in your life solely due to you. And it was so striking to me that this was taken as a, a radical critique of business rather than a fact about people. Yeah, no, I mean, that's it, you're right. I mean, I, the whole and the, the same thing was true in the 2012 presidential campaign when President Obama famously said, you didn't build that. And I think that's mm-hmm. what Warren was echoing, you know, in, in 2015 and 2016. And then Paul Ryan, who I like and admire in a lot of ways, had these like banners that said, like, you did build that. or Yes, we built this. And I mean, I, I get the point. Obviously, politics is is a fair is, is impoverished in a lot of ways. And obviously what they were reacting to is the kind of the preface to making a claim that government is the thing that owns everything. Uh, government is what we do together or something else that President Obama said. And, you know, I, I think one can acknowledge dependence and acknowledge our interconnectedness without necessarily committing him or herself to a specific governing vision of balancing, you know, private ordering versus government intervention. I think those are questions of means, but, um, but we should all, and the same thing reacting when Hillary Clinton and whenever it was in the nineties said it takes a village to raise a family. And, you know, Rick Santorum said, no, it takes parents to raise a family. And I get, again, I get the, why they were arguing with each other, but they're both right. You know, like there's a sense in which we yep. all have shared responsibility for everybody and becoming a parent actually, makes you alive to things that you never even thought about before, even silly little things like driving slowly in a neighborhood. Like I'm like, okay, I got to make sure that no kid comes darting out uh, because I know how stupid kids are because I have. them. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, and, and, you know, I, I make jo- in the book, I make a couple of jokes about this. I mean, I'm a big fan of the, uh, the office, both the British and the American office. And there was a, a sequence in it where Pam Beasley, the one of the protagonists, talks about how she sees the movie Pulp Fiction differently now and characters that she would have laughed at before who were kind of tragic, horrific figures. Now she says, well, that's somebody's child, you know, and so that's mm-hmm. a kind of a kind of waking up to the reality that we're all connected to each other. Yeah. You know, one thing I like in the book is that you really tease out this distinction that's not a partisan distinction. It's a philosophical distinction about these conflicting ideas about what the body is. You know, and in one philosophy, the body is something we receive as a gift, that something even in its weakness teaches us how to relate to each other if we're willing to accept it as good. But on the other hand, you talk about the philosophy of expressive individualism, which I think we've been kind of dancing around just now where the body is received as raw material to be reshaped and redefined as we define for ourselves what gives our lives meaning. Mm-hmm. So on the one hand, the body is tutelary, and on the other hand, it's clay. Right. And and what I'm wondering, you know, America really seems like a country full of expressive individualism. Mm-hmm. You know, how do, how do we work our way to a, a healthier 
vision of ourselves as a nation, as a body politic that can really let go of some of that sense that we're only worthwhile if we can point to ourselves as the author of everything in our life. How do we hold on to what's good about American competitiveness, ingenuity, just fire in the belly while not saying that's the sole measure of value in life? Well, actually, I mean, it's important to point out that I mean, expressive individualism is a kind of excess. It's a kind of extreme that privileges one account of what it means to be a human being and then forgets everything else. Um, there's a lot of truth in, in at the core of expressive individualism. There is, we are free, you know, we are, we, there is value in kind of interrogating the depths of our, of ourselves and finding original meaning and, and authentic meaning, and then using that to configure a life course. And sometimes it's a useful tool to react against certain kinds of mores and, and, and values of a community that need to be overthrown. Um, and, uh, but the issue is that that's not the only, that's, it, it goes quite, it goes off the rails when it gets confused and, and, and people think that that's the only truth about who we are, that really my truth is that I'm a mind and a will that can reflect and through introspection, come up with a life plan that I, that's original and distinctive to me. And that I'm going to pursue and everything else is instrumental to that goal not just my body, but my relationship to other people, the natural world, everything, right? It's all, it's all, I'm going to bend it for the sake of pursuing my originality. And um, that's, again, that's just not consistent with lived human experience. I mean, we've been, we've been sort of, you know, the question is how do we, how do we correct or, 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 to, or to, to protect ourselves from the temptation of believing that's all there is? Um, you know, I think, I think people becoming attentive to their surroundings, be, again, the, the, the arc of life is extremely instructive here, right? Mm -hmm. When you have a baby, when you become a parent, you realize there's a lot more to life than my own authentic originality and my creative capacities co to construct a future and that everybody else is instrumental. It's not, it's not, it's just, you completely, you, you're, you're shorn of that illusion when you're a parent, if you're attending to what, what, you know, to, to what your child is and represents, you know, the child is a gift to be welcomed and loved unconditionally, not something to be rationally ordered and mastered and to pour my aspirations into. Now, that's not to say people don't do that, you know, uh, but, but we should, you know, how do we, how do we prevent people from making those kinds of mistakes? I think, I think by drawing their attention to practices and realities that take them outside of themselves, parenthood, caring for the disabled, caring for the elderly, caring for the poor, care, feeding the hungry, you know, the kind of, Preferent to use the Catholic social thought language, the preferential option for the poor, right? I mean, this is Holy Week. We're thinking about, you know, we're thinking about what it means to be poor and what it means, what the incarnation means, um, and what it means for God to be tortured to death, right? I mean, like, I mean, to, to think about that uh, for a little bit. But like, so I mean, I think you know, there are different ways to transmit, um, you know, the, these 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 this sort of this this different way of thinking. I mean, I mean, there are cultural. There are cultural modes of instruction. There's obviously the law is pedagogical in important ways. I think I think they work. Culture and law work in tandem. I mean, I'm a law professor, and, and so I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm definitely biased in the direction of law as a tool of shaping culture, not merely reflecting culture. Uh, it does it, whether we like it or not. Law is going to shape culture for better or worse, and so we should at least be mindful of that in constructing the law. Um, but let me, but also as a lawyer and a person who's worked in public policy, I'm tempted to grant solutions. And in some time, and I think in this situation, you just have to be open to the possibility that there aren't grant solutions. And the way it works is just, you know, little platoons of people living in particular ways. And you're presented with a person in front of you and your job is to love the person that's in front of you. Uh, that, 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 and, and so, and that's, and that's how you transform the world through that kind of, that kind of radical, expression, prophetic expression of hospitality. Well, what I think is so challenging is that you're right. A lot of people do have access to this experience by becoming parents, by knowing other people's children. You know, a child is the place where people are most likely to come up against a lovable dependence, right. a natural dependence. And yet here we are, right? That hasn't been enough to jar us out of this way of thinking yet, even though everyone has been a baby. And perhaps if we could remember <laughs> that experience more, you know, right. vividly, we'd find this a little easier. But many people have seen and encountered babies. Sure. I, I, I thought it was so interesting in your book, you know, your emphasis on the dignity of the unchosen, you know, that we don't choose our bodies and their particular foibles, that 
despite everyone's best attempts through IVF, you know, you can't actually choose your child. You know, the people who offer to screen for personality are lying to you. Right. But parenthood itself is framed in our culture now as something that should be an active choice with abortion lurking as the way to unchoose a yep. child. And I found it so striking in the book itself that you argue that not only the mother and the father, but the whole community surrounding a parent are bound together by the unchosen presence of a child. Yes. Whereas in debates about abortion, the humanity of the child is written off because of what the baby can't do. The baby you know, before and after birth is dependent, right. can't feed himself, can't get where he needs to go, can't express himself. Yeah, desire. And you defend right. the Yep. And you defend the child's dependence, but you also when talking about the mother you know, say that she's like her child in her need and dependence, mm -hmm. rather than arguing, which I think is more common, that the child has dignity because he resembles his presumably autonomous mother. Right. And the passage that stood out to me in your book was law and policy animated by an anthropology of embodiment would view the mother as a vulnerable, dependent member of society who is entitled to the protections and support of the network of uncalculated giving and graceful receiving that must exist for any human being to survive and flourish. And usually you know, when we do what, what you're doing here, analogizing someone to the dependent state of a baby, it's called infantilizing and it's an insult. Yeah. So how do you work against this assumption when you're talking about this argument, that the child, you know, demands things of his mother by virtue of his need, and the mother's need to provide for a child demands things of a much broader group of people. Yeah. So, I mean, the attentive reader will notice that I don't, the mother is not unique in her entitlement to the network of uncalculated giving and graceful receiving or in her vulnerability or in her dependence. The book argues that every single human being by virtue of their embodiment, is dependent and vulnerable and the need of care and concern and subject to claims of other people who are in need of care and concern because it is in fact a network if we're gonna care rightly for human beings, which I which which is what I argue for in the book. So I can understand someone saying, you know, how dare you say that a woman is vulnerable and needs help, all she needs is an abortion. Um, mm -hmm. When I think sociologically that, that can't be right. I mean, like people that, in my life that I know who have gotten abortions or people who who uh, who have chosen not to get abort it's perfectly clear in the same way that that a person you know a person who is uh, sick and possibly dying you know all they need is assisted suicide to write the last chapter of their life or a person who's infertile all they need is IVF to 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 heal whatever wound bodily wound they have and to move on with their future and to pursue their pathway that's it just sounds honestly it sounds to me this is going to sound maybe crazy to your listeners and maybe it is crazy it sounds like the devil talking you know what i mean it, it's it's it sounds like all you have to do is this one thing this one thing and you can be like a god you can be independent you can be autonomous you can be free of all of your mutual dependency but you know, you can get an abortion, you can get IVF, you can kill yourself with this, with barbiturates. You are not actually um, freeing yourself of the bonds and mutual connection. And frankly, you're also not you're not engaging in just a self-regarding action in any of those things. You know, like because we're all connected to each other, everything we does, we do affects everyone else. So I can understand why someone might who is ready to hear uh, especially a man who's making a kind of pro-life argument, saying something that is denigrating uh, about a woman's independence and autonomy and so on. But I think I would say the same thing about a man. I would say the same thing about anybody. I, I do say the same thing about everybody. In the book. <laughs> if yes. you have a body, you are vulnerable and dependent and subject to natural limits, and you're entitled to my care. I'm, I'm, I, and I have to take care of you because we're all connected to each other. And, and, and oh, so that, yeah. That's what I want to kind of, drill in a little on because in that passage what I was really struck by you know is that sense of you know, who makes a demand on whom what what gives shape to that network of dependence because you know, you've you've made this hot button topic in bioethics abortion and the dignity of the child a key to understanding worth throughout life so the need of the mother is like the need of the child is like the need of a disabled person is like the need of someone who just has a 24 hour bug, but you know, right. is in intense need right this moment. Right. But you know, you analogize that unchosen obligation of the mother to her child, 
to the unchosen obligation of the community to, and this is the kind of the tricky part for grammat- me grammatically, mm-hmm. its mother, you know, whose community is in charge of this mother, so right? Every, so, so think about it this way. This is how I try to say it in the book. So and, and that, if you were, like, imagine a small town and you hear somebody scream or yell, there's a mother and a baby who've fallen in a well and they need our help. <laughs> Everybody's going to stop what they're doing and they're going to run and they're going to help. I mean, that's true even now. I mean, that's it, 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 it captures these kinds of stories capture news coverage. There's something that grabs onto our heart when someone vulnerable is in need and we all have to come to their aid. And there's it's not it's it's and it's simply and, and the, the key to the whole thing is that in order to flourish as a human being, because we are embodied, what we need and what we have to have are what I describe as networks and for after McIntyre, networks of uncalculated giving and graceful receiving. That's the, that's the scaffolding that we need to survive, but also to flourish and to learn to become the thing that we're supposed to be, which is the kind of person that can make the good of someone else our own good, to actually be it. So, I mean, and it's a normative claim. I'm not claiming to demonstrate this. I'm, I'm saying that my view is that because we are dependent and, and, and on one another and we're vulnerable, that... The only, and the only way we survive is through this pathway. What that means, in effect, is that we're made for love and friendship. And when someone is in need and suffering, obviously, I mean, there's a kind of principle of subsidiarity at work when I'm talking about the concentric circles of mother, child. I mean, because that's a parent-child situation, right? But when there's a parent and a child in crisis, that's a summons for everybody. That's a summons for and, – and it's because because, the, because of their vulnerability. We're responding in, in just generosity – to, to the to the to the measure of their vulnerability and anybody who says that a woman seeking a pregnancy or seeking an abortion because she's facing pregnancy isn't subject to, to serious burdens and serious risks and 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 anxiety and everything else that's the root by the way in the jurisprudence of the right to abortion it's because blackman said a woman is uniquely burdened in these ways that she has to have recourse to abortion and what i'm saying in this book i said i agree with you she's facing some pretty steep and difficult challenges, but the answer is not abortion. The answer is rendering aid and care in proportion to the, her and the baby's need and the family's need. I want to stick with this question, though, of, of how we find the people we're called to care for, because it feels like you know, you're yeah. talking about these concentric circles, but a, a lot of my experience of encountering people who are going through tough times is mediated through the internet, where you know, mm, yeah. there's an extent to which they're kind of circles of people I know better or worse. There are people where I've donated to their medical bills where I've never met them in person. Sure. But it's a, it's overwhelming. Uh, you know, the yeah. New York Times columnist Liz Brunig said it's like taking a God's eye view of the world where every part of human suffering right. might just turn up in a feed in front of you, yeah. you know, alongside jokes and photos of your right. friend's kids. Right. And it's like, so how, how do we Lopez, keep our- pray for this guy I met on the street today. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you stop, you pray, Hail Mary. You know, like, like yeah. So G- Gil Mylander talks about this a lot, right? And, he, and, and in a very interesting and compelling way about the cosmos of vocations and the idea that there, there, there could be a cosmos of vocations in which, like, I don't have to go out every night with a bucket of water and look around for fires to put out. You know what I mean? Like, like it, it is, it is the case that, Everyone has a vocation and, 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 you know, in a kind of micro fashion, you, you respond to the people that, to use the theological line, to God, that God puts in front of you. You know what I mean? And everyone has a different vocation, some of which is, you know, philanthropic, some of which is service, some of which is writing, some of which is artistic. But I mean, and, 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 and so one could, doesn't need to go insane thinking about like, you know, Oscar Schindler at the end of Schindler's List thinking I could have used this pen, this, you know, like they're kind of thinking about the people that he saved and then realizing he didn't do enough. I mean, that's good. I mean, in a way there, that comes from a good place, but I, and I'm not trying to make our lives easier uh, or make our, you know, to calm our, our conscience when it shouldn't be sad, we should be alive to these concerns. But at the same time, it's, you gotta, you gotta exercise some, prudential discipline and think about the, again, the kind of higher, the, the, the web of vocations that we all have and to realize that I don't have to do everything uh, for everybody. I just have to do the things that I'm able to do. And look, I mean, I have kids and a wife and a job and like, that doesn't mean I can't, I can't move. I mean, if I were to move to Calcutta and, and, and work with Mother Teresa's order, I would be leaving my family behind. Like that's not that can't be right, you know. What I mean? So, so there's so it's a matter of discernment, and you know those of and, and trying to. But as you say, the point you make is really interesting. That is to say, given the way communications is is has been amplified through social media, 
you can be overwhelmed. But truthfully, anybody who's got you know creative can be overwhelmed by thinking for a minute about <laughs> Bangladesh or downtown or my neighbor next door or whatever. Like, I mean, you, you could, you could, you could you've become paralyzed by it. And that's why I think especially high achieving people, people who are like want to go into public policy or people who are lawyers or people who think in grand terms can be paralyzed by the size of the problem. But you just got to, it's like eating an, I mean, this isn't a bad, I wasn't eating an elephant. That's not a good example. Uh, you shouldn't eat elephants, but like trying to eat something really big, you, t- you take it one bite at a time. You know what I mean? And, and you have to believe it. You have to trust in God too. I mean, you have to trust that there's providence and there's a kind, and again, as, as, as Mylander says, there's a kind of, there's a, a, a network of vocations out there composed of people who are all hopefully, you know, in a, imperfect ways trying to, to grapple towards doing the right thing. Yeah, yeah, this this question of how do we address a big problem with small everyday practices in a way at the heart of what we're trying to do here with the Worthy Life Project. You know, in your book, you talked about that being fully human means practicing the virtues necessary to sustaining life as humanly lived. You know, living out those unchosen obligations, that economy of giving and receiving. And so, what I'm wondering, you know. We, we want to be attentive to virtue as a practice, you know, not waiting till virtue is required of us by some big ass, right. but something we inculcate daily. So you, know, you do think at that big level of the law and bioethics policy, but do you have any kind of practices daily, whether chosen or kind of unchosen, that help you keep developing this attentiveness outside a law book, but to particular human beings? Yeah, uh, I go to confession a lot. <laughs> and, and so, I mean, well, not a lot. I mean, not like Martin Luther or something. But, <laughs> but like, you know, I, I, uh, I, um, and the truth, again, it's back, it's back with my kids. Like, I try to think about every, I mean, they're, they're watching all the time, all the time. And so I try to be very, not, not ostentatious, but I try to be thoughtful about the little sort of micro decisions I make, even in things like just being, snarky about other people you know what i mean like, like that's so and as you talk about social media that the temptation to be funny and to get a laugh and to be snarky and and to hurt people's feelings um you know just to try to just, and, and also taking responsibility you know the, these are th- like when you do make a mistake around the kids around my colleagues at work and try and i'm not and by the no means am i successful at this right like which is why i go to confession a lot um but but it is the case that i think that just look, you take the person that's in front of you and you treat them. I mean, Mother Teresa is, I keep coming back to her. I mean, she famously said that we, the reason, if we have no peace in the world is because we've forgotten that we belong to each other. That's a, that, that to me is like a more eloquent way to say what I was trying to say in the book uh, and more eloquent through her, her, her life. Right. I mean, she cared for people who had literally people wouldn't look at, you know, she would treat them as if she had Christ in her arms. And, um, and, you know, the people that we interact with, I mean, that, that's, I mean, we all recognize the, the heroism in that. But what about just like daily interactions with people, micro decisions, the point at which you have a choice to go one of two ways. And one way is the way of compassion and love and just generosity and hospitality and misericordia. And the other way is kind of, I'm going to, I'm too busy for that. I'm going to focus on, you know, doing what I need to do um, uh, because what I'm doing is important because I'm important, right? Like that's, just every, just every day, every choice trying, and then, you know, and then exam, and then the confession thing was kind of a joke, but not really because you are trying to examine what you've been up to, like to examine your own progress in these ways and to try to hold yourself to account and to be around people that will hold you to account um, when you don't, when you're not living up to these standards, you know, but I will say this, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to keep going on and on, but I do think that the law is is essential for shaping culture. And I don't think it's just, and, I, and with respect to the issues that I take up in the book, the questions of abortion and, and, and assisted reproduction, end-of-life decision-making, I think the law should be involved. And I think that the law should be involved at, the, at least at the level of protecting the weakest and most vulnerable, and that itself is pedagogical, right? Like if the law leaves these folks behind, it's not you can't blame someone who's not otherwise got good teachers for thinking, oh, well, I guess that doesn't matter. I guess I guess I guess the human life, the child in the womb is nothing. You know, I guess the person who's who's unconscious and dependent on life sustaining measures is is kind of nothing that their life is over or that um, whatever I need to make a baby, you know, I should be able to do because that's really nothing. That's just kind of parts as parts, you know? And I think that the law should be instrumental and in protect, because I mean, the law exists to protect and promote the flourishing 
of persons and to a lesser extent it's an imperfect but essential teacher and i think that i think there there should be uh actual system wide uh legal interventions to uh, on these particular questions yeah, I appreciate what you say about the law being a teacher here, because I think this touches on the question of whether the law is about, you know, bare equality or about equity to an extent. You mm-hmm. know, if if we have people who are in some sense disadvantaged by their bodies, by other weakness, you know, d- does a fair law treat them as exactly the same as everyone else and hold them to a, the extent the way our abortion laws do to the same standard yeah. of, you know, existence as everyone else? Or... Does the law single them out in some sense in order to raise them to or to recognize equal dignity um, by having special provision for them? Yeah, no, I mean, I think I think that um, the law should I mean, again, the law shouldn't kid itself about what it can do and what it can't do. And this is the real problem in Justice Ginsburg, the late Justice Ginsburg's reasoning. I mean, fundamentally, she what she said about abortion is the current thinking among the elite about why there should be abortion rights. Reva Siegel at Yale Law School, for example, saying that abortion is a mechanism of liberation for women to pursue a life that is identical in its cooperation or participation in the civic and economic life of the country. A woman needs to be able to do what a man does in terms of sexual expression, sexual uh, behavior, and needs to be free to participate as he does. And the only way you can do that in a world where by vir- virtue of natural endowment, she gets pregnant and he doesn't, she has to have recourse to abortion. And that's a kind of, um, you know, you have to be cognizant of what of what the means of the law are. I mean, and I think she kind of skates over that, doesn't actually engage the question of what or who the unborn child is or whether it matters or not if the unborn child is a, is a person or part of the moral legal community. Um, so, but I mean, I'm, I, I admire those laws that try to require accommodations for people so that they can have the fullest life they can have. Uh, but there, are, one has to be attentive to the mechanisms by which we accomplish those goals. And abortion is the most kind of dramatic example where we accomplish, we, we, we license the freedom of a woman by, by, by authorizing lethal violence. Yeah, I think we could have a whole separate discussion about the the form of feminism that helps women by helping them catch up to be more like men, right? Where we, yeah, and yeah. I think this is not limited to a question of women versus men, but this question of people who are more dependent at a certain period of time or less dependent. If we take the least dependent person as our legal norm of a person, you know, is everything else all about catching people up to that level of non-dependence or is it about accommodating them as equal citizens where they are? No, that's very nicely said. And it's a very potent feminist critique to that, that observes that what we're doing in, in Justice Ginsburg's approach is valorizing male behavior and making that the standard. And, and women are valuable to the extent that they can be like men. And that and and a lot of very powerful feminist critique is, no, that has, has it exactly wrong. That doesn't respect what women are as women. It simply tries to make them like men. And that's that's a, that's that's in some ways trying to resorb women into the masculine standard. Well, the last question I'd like to ask you in our time together, I think folks can go through a period of life where you know, they don't experience heavy physical dependence of their own. You know, maybe they're in their mid 20s, early 30s. Their back hasn't gone out yet. And when they kind of review their habits of the day, the way you talked about thinking about how you treat people in front of them, they may find they don't see much need around them. You know, their Mm -hmm. streets have homeless people kind of pushed out to the margins. They're not along their commute. Uh, The people who are their friends, who are parents, have kind of moved further away from them and their children and their needs are more absent from them. Mm -hmm. People who are elderly live far away or are warehoused. How can someone take one step closer to need so yeah. that they are being confronted by the dependence of others and yeah. their prime of life. Well, that's, that's a great point, a great question. And, you know, Pope Francis, you can't improve much on what he says, but you have to go to the peripheries, right? Like you have to, you have to go to, and, but you don't have to look very far, honestly. It could be like, I mean, if you are at an elite institution that is in a place that has been sanitized of all poor people and whatever, I mean, there's still folks that work there. 
right? There are still people mm-hmm. that, uh, that, that if you look around, there are people who serve you probably that, uh, uh, could, you know, that at the very least are entitled to the basic decency of your kindness and respect, right? Not in a kind of, not in a kind of condescending way, of course, not in a, like, oh, I have the, I am this, I'm going to travel to these, these impoverished places. Also, there's a risk of like, okay, I'm going to go to Africa or I'm going to go to the, you know, how about go downtown? You know what I mean? Africa, we I mean, yeah. or do, do all of it, but like you could start, it's romantic to like go to a completely different culture and whatever, but, it, but there's a, a less romantic version of that, which is, but and might be more valuable in the immediate term is to, I mean, I guarantee you that there's somebody nearby that could use your help. There's some old person that is lonely that could use your help. There is a family that needs help. There's a food bank. I mean, there's all kinds of things that one can do. And, and thankfully at a lot of these, elite institutions, um, which, which value expressions of charity and and social justice, you know, you can, it's not hard to find people that need your help, you know, but even, even people in your, that you encounter every day, you don't know what they're carrying around, you know, befriend people, be kind to people, see if, see if you can be helpful. I've been really touched in the kind of wake of the pandemic of the mutual aid groups that have sprung up locally, which have brought a lot more of the need of my community directly in front of me, rather than being something I have to work as hard to find out about. Yeah. And it started after the acute need of the pandemic that people are still going through you know, basic needs that are less related, even just theft of back wages. And what will the community do right. to you know make this economic injustice right? Right. That's a really nice point. I, that's uh, absolutely well, thank you so much for joining me today, Professor Sneed. No, it's great. Our guest has been our guest has been Professor Sneed, the author of What It Means to Be Human. And if people want to learn more about your writing or your work, where should they go to find you? So you can find me at the University of Notre Dame Law School website, but also you can go to the website of the De Nicola Center for Ethics and Culture, ethicscenter.nd.edu. We have a whole variety of programming and resources that people might find interesting. If they're interested in the subjects of this book, then there's a lot to enjoy and digest uh, at our website. Thank you all so much for joining us for this conversation. This is the Worthy Life Project, where we turn to creative thinkers to ask our most pressing questions. I'm your host, Leah Sargent, and you can follow our work on Twitter at at Worthy Life Talks or subscribe for free on Substack or at the Worthy Life Project Substack.com. See you next time. And until then, remember, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit.